No, people have been preaching about God and Jesus for thousands of years, so I figure by now we have to get it, right? I mean, really, are we that dense? So why take more of your time to say what you've already heard, many of you all of your lives? I thought today, since we've been preaching about God and Jesus for so long, I would preach for a moment about us. Though there are many bright lights out there, people who are doing very good things for very good reasons, there seems to remain an awful lot of folks who spend a lot of their time as people of faith worrying about their eternal souls. We have generations of people who have feared the fires of hell so profoundly that they would do quite literally anything to avoid them. They would believe anything they were told, do anything they were told, because the church or some holy person in authority said so. Consequently, we have had generations of people more than willing to tell us what to do, what to believe in order to be spared eternal damnation, what you should give, what you should follow, what wars you must fight, what money you have to relinquish, how you should worship, what you must believe, and so on and so on. And another thing, for the times of the ancient Hebrews, we Christians have believed that it is God who sends curses and God who offers blessings. It must be God who brings destruction and war, disease and disaster. Yet we look to God to save us from these very terrors. How confusing! How then can we win when the game seems rigged? And another thing, we have spent countless lifetimes pretty sure that some can get to God and some cannot. Doubtless there is ample Christian scripture to support such a position. And so many human beings have honed much skills in the areas of prejudice and exclusivity, despite a call from Jesus to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We do get out with each other, sometimes quite violently, since somebody is sure that their way is right and somebody else's is wrong. And all that violence in the Old Testament, that must truly be a reflection of the nature of God, right? Not the nature of humankind. Therefore, we fight over what we think is right. Since we do these things, and many others, that don't seem ultimately to live up to our idea of good, we're back to where we started. We fear for our eternal souls. For many, Lent becomes a time of wash and abject guilt, or poverty of spirit, Surely we cannot be pleasing to God. And so our standards go up, while our performance still tends to go down, and that leaves us sort of, well, condemned, I guess. So actually, I am going to preach about God and Jesus. That's a good thing. Because it concerns ultimate things, things about our living and our dying. It did not take the earliest Christians too long to realize that something new was at work in Jesus. The salvation he had to offer them was not built upon human governments or personal power or wealth and riches. It did not guarantee them security or popularity, but it did give them something. It gave them hope and purpose. And how do they recall their Lord's, our Lord's, take on humankind? My favorite recollection from the scripture goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. But it doesn't stop there. When people wondered if God was out to get them, didn't care for them, wasn't there for them. There were other words to remember. These words, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through. There it is. The Jesus mission in a nutshell. But what comes after that? comes after this piece of the passage in John's Gospel is pretty well up to us. To believe is eternal life. To fail to believe is not. 
To believe is to live and act in the light. This is freeing and eternal. To fail to believe is to live and act in the dark. This is burdensome and deadly. Before you start running through the tenets of the Nicene Creed and struggling with what you're able to believe in this contemporary scientific and literal world in which we now live, please know this. The root word from which believe comes in the Greek language bears the same connotations as the English words for faith or trust, even confidence for me. This brings about my very sense of hope that I find in Jesus. I am confident that his way of humility, his care for others, and respect before the power that creates all things is good. I am confident that what we are and what we do matters forever. I am confident that what we break and what gets broken can be healed through love and forgiveness, though perhaps not without pain or sacrifice or grief. I am confident that God, as Jesus reveals God, is a real and gracious presence moving within a challenging, meaningful, difficult, sometimes scary, and in almost countless ways, incredibly beautiful world. I am confident that God so loves the world. Is such a faith tested every day? But I choose to believe, to trust, to have faith, to be confident. Not in the fairy tale images of a religion that promises no sickness or death to my enemies or worldly riches, no struggles, perpetual protection against all the forces of nature. Rather, I trust in the one we call Son of God, that what he says is reasonable and true. Love is in this world, and condemnation is not a part of God's plan or desire. Forgiveness is a reality. Light is present, though there is much darkness. Which will we choose? And you guys know, we know all this stuff. At least, we've been told, though thousands of years later, we still seem to need to hear it, and there are others who need to hear it too, and maybe right from us. Maybe we are the ones, maybe the ones, that, we're the ones that need to hear it most. Jesus said, for God so loved you, that he gave Jesus so that you who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. D. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn you, but in order that you might be saved through him.